I am uh, Ricardo Munoz, the Chief of Cardiac Critical Care Medicine, Co-Director of the Heart Institute, and Executive Director of Telemedicine at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. I hope uh, all is well and safe with you and your family during these difficult and unprecedented times. Welcome to our sixth uh, COVID-19 multi-center CICU response virtual conference. The goal of this weekly meeting is to share our experience with COVID-19 pandemic and learn how it is impacting our practice in the cardiac units. On the line today, we have uh, cardiac nurses and doctors from the United States and many other countries around the world. Our conference uh, call will start with a 15-minute uh, lectures, followed by a 20 minutes of global experts' opinions, moderated by Dr. Gil Wernowski, who is the senior consultant of pre-cardiac medicine and cardiology and founder of our Neurocardiac Critical Care Program at Children's National. And finally, a round of questions coordinated by Melissa Jones, our CICU nurse practitioner and director of our Neurocardiac Critical Care Program and is the incoming president for the PCICS. All logistics and engineering of the meeting has been organized by Marty Arroyave Wessel, manager of telehealth, and Dr. Alejandro Lopez, medical director of uh, telehealth. I would like to thank uh, Roberta DiBiasi, chief of infectious disease at Children's National, who helped us to organize the wonderful team of global experts. We have also in the line uh, Dr. Rolando Ulloa Gutierrez, who is from the Kawasaki uh, Disease Research Network involving investigators from Latin America in 20 countries. It is with great pleasure uh, to introduce two fantastic, two fantastic speakers uh, on today's call. We have uh, first Maria Clara Escobar, cardiologist uh, from Children's Hospital in Barcelona, Spain, and then Dr. Alain Freis, uh, Chief of Cardiology at the Royal Brompton in UK. Our topic is um, Pediatric Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome or Kawasaki Life Disease Associated with COVID-19. We have a great audience uh, last uh, week uh, with uh, Joan Sanchez and um, Alain Freis. And we decided to bring them, uh, their team back, and now is with Maria Clara for talking about part two of this disease. Maria Clara, the audience is yours. yours. Thank you for being with us. You can start sharing your slides, uh, Maria Clara. Maria, yeah. Okay, so today I will present our experience during the coronavirus pandemia. It is interesting how one month after the peak of the pandemia in adults, we began to see children with inflammatory involvement associated with the coronavirus. Currently in Spain, there is a thousand active pediatric cases of coronavirus, third of them hospitalized and 5% in the ICU. So today, as I told you, I will present our experience in collaboration with the Spanish Society of Pediatric Cardiology, and in particular with La Paz Hospital in Madrid. So we have had 12 patients in Barcelona and 10 patients in Madrid in the last month that we have had classified as typical Kawasaki, Kawasaki-like, or Corona shock. So we have had five typical Kawasaki, all of them negative for coronavirus, nine Kawasaki-like, positive for coronavirus, and 11 Corona shock, which is a severe expression of Kawasaki-like syndrome that we think that, is, that it is, presented with ventricular dysfunction. So patients with typical Kawasaki presented with a typical Kawasaki picture. 
And on the echocardiography, two out of these five patients presented with coronary um, involvement. All of them received appropriate treatment for KD. And in general, they had very high platelet counts, mildly elevated pro BNP and ferritin. This is a four month older baby with bilateral coronal, uh, coronary aneurysms. And this is a 20 month old girl who had two normal echoes that developed dilation of left coronary artery 10 days after the beginning of the disease, even though she received a uh, proper treatment with IVIG and aspirin. In general, all patients had at the beginning of the disease mildly elevated ferritin and CRP with normal platelet count that increased around the third day of to very high levels. In our hospital, we always measure levels of BMP as part of our protocol for Kawasaki disease. And in these patients, they were mildly elevated with posterior normalization. So this is the last results of these typical Kawasaki patients. And we, you can see that this for BNP around 3,000 and ferritin around 200 are similar to those values in our KD patients in the last five years. Moving to a patient with Kawasaki-like syndrome, they presented with an atypical picture with prolonged fever and gastrointestinal symptoms, some of them with exanthema, bilateral conjunctival congestion, lymphadenopathy, but in general they were fine and they had normal systolic function without coronary involvement. They were treated, some of them with steroids, with steroids some of them with IVG aspirin. And as you can see, most patients had thrombocytic, um, sorry. So in this, in this graph, unlike patients with typical Kawasaki disease, patients with Kawasaki-like have higher levels of ferritin and lower levels of platelets at the beginning of the disease, which then normalize. Then they presented also with very high levels of pro-BMP, around 10,000. And as you can see here, most patients have thrombocytopenia, very high levels of pro-BMP, D-dimer, and ferritin. Comparing the laboratory findings in these two groups, you can see that patients with Kawasaki-like in blue have lower platelet counts, higher pro-BMP, ferritin, and D-dimer. Those patients with corona shock were previously healthy kids who presented with fever, gastrointestinal symptoms, and exanthema without respiratory symptoms. The X-ray was normal, the, the chest X-ray was normal, and in the echocardiography, we had patients with severe, severe LV dysfunction, as this patient, that then resolved after inotropic su um, support and mechanical ventilation. From the laboratory point of view, this patient had high pro-BMP and D-dimer that increased to very high levels and then decreased after the treatment in that with IVIG. So in summary, we have had three different types of patients. Those with typical Kawasaki disease, those with Kawasaki-like syndrome, and finally those with the corona shock syndrome. So that's it. This is our experience from Spain. Thank you very much, Maria Clara. Great information. And now we're moving to Alain uh, from the Royal Brompton in uh, London, UK. Alain, are you there? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank yes. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I, I can't thank everyone, but uh, uh, especially the uh, registrar who helped me with this. And 
this is the presentation that uh, I, I, of course, share with uh, our uh, partners, the St. Mary's uh, uh, Infectious Disease and Immunology team. Um, and Damien Bonnet from uh, Necker and the French who provided uh, the French data. So this is the... Um, um, basically the diagnosis criteria uh, from the um, British uh, uh, group of experts. And uh, uh, what is, as you can see, this comprise a wide spectrum of symptoms. So I think this is uh, interesting as the group of Barcelona has a classification among uh, uh, this uh, uh, type of patients. Uh, what is not fully clarified is uh, uh, how, what is really the percentage of patients who have cardiac involvement during the acute phase, during Kawasaki syndrome, uh, it's not the case, they are not in shock, but in this uh, uh, type of patient, it seems that the cardiac involvement is quite uh, uh, intense. Um, and also, um, I'm going to share with you the update from the French group. So, um, at the at the end of the last week, they had 51 PICU cases, and this is likely to be underestimated. From all age, uh, most of them were in heart failure, and uh, they thought it was going to be a one-week bonus of admission, but they, they have had constantly some admission, and not in all the area uh, of... Um, um, of France, uh, some of uh, uh, the area, especially in South and South Swiss, which have been preserved from COVID, have been also preserved from this uh, uh, inflammatory disease. Um, so they have various symptoms, uh, left ventricular dysfunction. Troponin uh, is a bit disappointing. And according to the, uh, my French colleague, the most sensitive marker seems to be anti-proBNP. When it is very high, uh, the patients uh, uh, score quality with the patient being troubled. ECG uh, shows limited anomaly. Uh, of course, lots of inflammation and COVID status positive in 63% uh, um, of the patients. Most of them need inotropic support. What is interesting in the French group is that they had a total of 10 ECMO, uh, so 20% ECMO out of 51 cases. Uh, despite this uh, uh, very intense presentation, they had uh, they could win eight of the ten ECMO uh, and were uh, were ongoing. They had no deaths so far, and they aggressively uh, treated them with uh, anti-inflammatory uh, therapy. Uh, the UK data on 35 children uh, were been provided by uh, Liz Whitaker. Uh, their age is. Uh, uh, most, most of them are uh, above uh, two, three years, but there are some uh, patients who can be very young, 60% of male, uh, and 73% uh, uh, are uh, um, uh, black, Asiatic, or uh, uh, minority ethnic. And um, um, only two ECMO, but unfortunately one death. Similarly, very aggressive anti-inflammatory treatments. They all have fever, uh, most of them present with shock, but uh, you can see the um, um, frequency, 60% uh, have abdominal, uh, have GI symptoms, which is uh, quite striking. Whereas as compared to Kawasaki, only 30% would have conjunctivitis. Um, the outcome, 70% uh, uh, were in shock uh, and ventilated. Uh, they had uh, uh, one patient sitting in renal replacement therapy and 85% uh, uh, had some uh, chest X-ray uh, changes. I want to show that, of course, this patient, they had uh, huge uh, inflammation. I can't uh, uh, further detail that. Uh, a significant amount of them were COVID uh, positive as well. And the echo uh, was, I think, probably the echo was performed on all the patients, but we have only data uh, on, uh, um, on the incomplete part of the population. And despite that, we have some significant uh, anomaly. Uh, we have uh, uh, significantly impaired ventricular function 
uh, well, eight out of 90, uh, I think it's probably a, a bit underestimated. Uh, and uh, uh, some of them had uh, significant coronary uh, anomalies that present rather earlier than in typical Kawasaki syndrome. Just to give you an example of a patient, because these, all these patients are not in PICU, this is a patient admitted in our ward, a uh, five-year-old, typical Kawasaki presentation, plus a, bit, a little bit of GI um, symptoms, uh, important inflammation, troponin 77, and um, coronaries are normal, slightly impaired uh, longitudinal strain uh, on the echo. And after 24 hours, uh, troponin uh, normalized, but um, there was still uh, increased edema and uh, uh, important inflammation. And what we saw is a, a bit of left ventricular dysfunction, mainly. Um, um, depressed that normalized after, after 24 hours. You can see that uh, here. So this patient has typical Kawasaki, but uh, high troponin and ventricular dysfunction during the acute phase um, responded very well to anti-inflammatory therapy. And uh, now okay, he's, he's ready to, to go home. Uh, but, so this is a new syndrome that is different from Kawasaki. Coronavirus uh, is not the most frequently associated. Uh, you know, plenty of virus has been associated to Kawasaki disease. There have been a few publications, but it's not commonly associated. Many, many other virus like enterovirus has been associated with, uh, uh, with Kawasaki, so it is uh, difficult to conclude. I just want to give you, to finish with the importance of follow-up of this patient. And also maybe uh, the fact that uh, some of uh, these patients previously existed. This is uh, the case of an 18-month-old man, Afro-American, who presented uh, last November in our unit after out-of-hospital arrest. And you can see on the echocardiography, so there was an uh, extremely depressed left ventricular function, was put on ECMO uh, uh, during admission in our PICU, and uh, troponin was extremely high, 27,000. And we found uh, on the initial echo some flow in the left main coronary artery. But then, because of this troponin, uh, we decided to do a CT scan. Importantly, this patient had in spring 2019, one year ago, intense fever for 10 days and uh, some atypical um, incomplete Kawasaki profile. It was, uh, it went to a &E, was suspected to have measles and was just discharged. So, uh, we did on the CT scan, we, we found a uh, uh, left main uh, coronary occlusion, which was confirmed in the CAT lab. We had to stand that in emergency. Patients uh, uh, improved and now he's home. Six months uh, uh, after this episode, he's doing completely fine, normal left ventricular function. So it's a kind of miraculous recovery. But uh, can we say this child had uh, Kawasaki? Certainly not typical Kawasaki. There is the ethnicity. Uh, uh, the clinical presentation was uh, atypical and uh, no aneurysm, but uh, left main coronary artery stenosis. So I think if we don't, I'm just a bit afraid that uh, with all these patients, uh, we need to follow them up and to investigate them if we don't want to have uh, 10 or 15 patients uh, like that in, uh, in six months. Maybe it's a bit, uh, I would say, proud with statements, but I think uh, uh, we, we need to investigate them just like uh, a new uh, inflammatory disease. So we are launching in our hospital a screening platform with the goal to see this patient within one week after a discharge and perform a, a several investigation. So the blobs will be uh, guided by our colleague uh, from uh, ID uh, at St. Mary's, and uh, we will also collect uh, um, blood investigation to better study uh, them uh, in terms of uh, um, genetic profile. Uh, of course, we are going to do ECG and Holter. Uh, we think they should undergo more than a, a echocardiography, so we plan to do a um, cardiac uh, magnetic resonance imaging, especially for the patient who have had uh, some high troponin and evidence of myocarditis. Um, uh, well, abdominal ultrasound is more for the acute phase. Uh, 
uh, and uh, of course uh, echocardiography. Uh, some of these patients, uh, uh, because they will have vascularitis, we will do peripheral scan, we will do uh, potentially coronary uh, CT depending of uh, uh, their uh, presentation. So uh, just wanted to finish my presentation by insisting on the need to reorganize uh, uh, follow-up. Uh, um, my Kawasaki clinic, I'm director of the Kawasaki clinic at the Bonton, will be multiplied by three or four. So we are, uh, uh, there is a strong need uh, to organize our units to follow and investigate these patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful uh, lecture. I, Alain, I'm shocked about the uh, ECMO situation, but I have to move on. Before I move and transfer to uh, Gil, uh, I would like to thank uh, John, uh, John Castello for supporting us from the PCACS, uh, Joan Sanchez and Jogan Sin for the uh, European Association of Pediatric Cardiology Working Group of uh, Cardiac Intensive Care. Gil, uh, are you there? I am. Hi, everybody. This is Gil Warnowski. I'm right down the hall from Ricardo, actually. It's uh, wonderful to see so many familiar faces from all over the world. Um, Margie, I was wondering if you could put the, um, the polling questions up right now. If everybody just take a little break. Yes. We're going to ask just a few questions, and then after the next presentation, we will be summarizing the results. So to get an idea of what um, our audience is like today, if you could maybe click one of these uh, possible options here. Uh, and then click submit, and we'll do that for about 20 seconds or so, and then we'll go to the next question. All right, we probably got everybody back to their laptops and computers by then. Um, why don't we go to the next question, please, Marsh? Yes, actually, everyone can uh, scroll uh, through uh, the three cool. questions. Thank you. Yep. So I'll do that, okay. And uh, I apologize if there are um, uh, categories that uh, we left out here. Um, it will be interesting. We'll be taking a look at the results of those three questions uh, in about uh, 20 or 25 minutes after uh, the next group. Before we, I'm just gonna pull my slides up here real quick. Um, I just wanted to, uh, go over just a couple of things before we move into the next section. I am really happy to uh, be involved to uh, first introduce uh, one of our global experts. But I just wanted to show everybody one thing uh, in terms of social distancing. I had the pleasure of being on service about a week, a week and a half ago, and uh, Dr. Munoz, Dr. Lopez have been working on our telemedicine and robot capabilities. This is, um, this is how we're doing distancing rounds here in the cardiac ICU with Children's National. Uh, on the robot, which we call BearBot, is uh, our dietitian Sarah Petraska and our uh, pharmacist, uh, Laura Leathers. Um, and it's amazing how the kids love to see them. Uh, and uh, I think one of them even asked how they got inside the robot. Um, we, we know our field, and our, I agree with uh, Ricardo. I want to thank the members of the Cardiac Intensive Care Society for joining us. We sort of defined our field a while ago with the junction of pediatric critical care and uh, congenital cardiology, pediatric congenital cardiology. Um, we're in a new era with this illness now, um, and I'm really pleased that the next uh, three presenters are going to give us an idea of the intersection between what has traditionally been uh, cardiac intensive care and the overlap now of many, many uh, subspecialties. Uh, so with that, I am really pleased uh, to introduce a, a longtime friend uh, and someone actually who needs no introduction, but my good friend, uh, Dr. Jane Newberger. Uh, she is the Commonwealth Endowed Professor up at uh, Boston Children's Hospital, uh, world's expert on so many things, uh, and I'm really happy to introduce Jane, who's going to kick off the expert panel. Okay. Uh, so... Hold on a second. First of all, good afternoon, and, and thank you to Ricardo and to Gil for the invitation. I'm going to take a step back 
just to take a look at the reasons that somebody could present with cardiac dysfunction in SARS-CoV-2. Uh, one can actually have direct myocarditis and direct myocardial injury, or there can be indirect mechanisms like demand ischemia, uh, cytokine storm, and hyperinflammation, and these all lead to microvascular dysfunction, thrombosis, and indirect effect, and one is left with uh, either cardiac dysfunction from cytokine storm or real myocardial injury. Um, so we've all seen the guidance on pediatric multisystem inflammatory syndrome temporally associated with COVID. I'm still trying to figure out a good um, acronym. Uh, and uh, this definition from that is a child presenting with fever, inflammation, one or more organ dysfunction, and then certain clinical and lab features, exclusion of other microbial causes, uh, and then SARS-CoV-2 can be positive or negative, although some patients actually already have antibodies. And we're here because uh, children can fulfill full or partial criteria for KD. Uh, for those, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we cannot see your slides. You can't see my slides? No. Oh, no. Did uh, you, did you, um, do you have them up? Can you hit the green button that says share screen? Oh, sure. Uh, can you see them now? Not yet. Anything? No? Gil uh, maybe Gil, Gil is still here. has a screen. I can't share while you're up. Yeah, Gil, please stop sharing. No, there's nothing shared right now on the screen. Can you can you pull up Jane's slides? Oh, you're muted. Hello. You can hear me though, right? Cardiac intensive care. Yeah, we can hear you. Cardiac intensive care is much easier than Zoom. <laughs> um, it worked perfectly. Uh, how about now? Does it work now? Yes. Something is coming uh, up now. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, so, yeah. but you can see it now. Uh, yes. So, for those who aren't that familiar with Kawasaki disease, it affects about 5,000 U.S. children each year. It's the leading cause of acquired heart disease in children in developed countries. And despite IBIG within the first 10 days, uh, if you use American Heart Association Z-score criteria, about one in four children and almost a little over half of children of infants under six months will have either dilated coronaries or aneurysms. Um, so giant aneurysms are, of course, what we really fear, and they can lead to myocardial ischemia, infarction, sudden death. We don't know yet whether that's going to be the case for the COVID-associated uh, syndromes. Uh, as was already alluded to, there's been a lot of uh, research into the causes of KD. I think it's fair to say that almost everybody in the field thinks it's not going to be a single trigger, although there's a lot of excellent research that Ann Rowley is doing on uh, a potential new viral agent, a lot of interesting climatic uh, research as well. Uh, diagnostic criteria include fever, plus four out of five uh, clinical criteria, which include uh, conjunctival injection, erythema in the lips, tongue, and oropharynx, a rash, swollen hands and feet, or a cervical lymph node, uh, which is the least common. But if you actually survey patients with aneurysms, uh, we did this over four uh, large referral centers, about a third of patients with, so with Kawasaki disease never met four out of five criteria. And because of this, the epidemiologic case definition in the 2004 American Heart Association guidelines first noted that you can diagnose KD in patients who have fever, even if they have fewer than four principal criteria if you have coronary aneurysms. So 5% of Kawasaki patients uh, have Kawasaki shock syndrome. Interestingly, it's less common in Asia than in Western countries. It looks a lot like septic shock and toxic shock syndrome, 
Uh, compared to Kawasaki patients without shock, they're more likely to have severe GI symptoms, more likely to have uh, lower platelets, increased D-dimers, increased CRP, uh, hyponatremia, increased hepatic enzymes, uh, low albumin, lactic acidosis, and coagulopathy. They're also more likely to have IVIG resistance. Uh, the 80% in published series have had an elevated troponin or CKMB. About 40% have at least mild MR, and a third will have a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. And this is a group of patients that has a higher likelihood of developing coronary aneurysms. So what's the pathophysiology? Uh, we don't know the trigger for traditional Kawasaki disease, uh, but there is an immune response that both involves a uh, uh, kind of a cytokine storm and also reduced left ventricular function that can be related to the cytokine storm. But interestingly, KD children have been well proven to have a neutrophilic myocarditis. It's one of the few forms of myocarditis that is neutrophil laden. Those neutrophils and platelets also marginate, uh, and uh, neutrophils will destroy the arterial wall, providing the first step in the creation of aneurysms. We also know that there's a vasodilation response, vascular leak, uh, and decreased systemic vascular resistance and organ perfusion. So just to conclude what's needed, we need research protocols that uh, include obtaining serum and plasma samples, DNA and RNA studies for biobanks. And just as Elaine just uh, stated, we desperately need uh, data integration across existing and planned registries. Uh, and that will have to be multidisciplinary and multinational. Uh, I think it's going to be important to have unique patient identifiers so we don't have duplicate publication uh, of cases. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think I'm no longer shared. Yes, you're all set. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, Roberta is going to be up next. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I'm Roberta DiBiase. I'm the Chief of Infectious Diseases here at Children's National. And again, thank you um, to all the presenters, but it's really my honor to present to my colleagues in infectious diseases to give us some additional data and commentary. So um, we're going to start with Jane Burns. And Jane is the Director of the Kawasaki Disease Clinic at Rady Children's in San Diego and also the Director of the Kawasaki Disease Research Center at UC San Diego. She's also a professor of pediatrics at UC San Diego, and she's really internationally known for over three decades of research focused on Kawasaki. She has over 170 publications in this area, and she's a co-author of the guidelines from AHA. And really, her, um, her research is cutting edge across clinical epidemiologic and lab research. Um, she collaborates amongst uh, people all over the world, but in particular across the U.S., and in Japan, and um, she really has done lots of seminal work with etiology, pathophysiology, genetics, environmental factors, risk models, uh, you name it, she's really had her hand in it. And I've been really fortunate to work with her more closely in the last year in her role as the PI for a multi-center study that is looking at uh, re treatments for refractory Kawasaki. So with that as a short introduction, it could be a lot longer, uh, but we wanna hear from her. Um, we'll take it away with Jane. Thank you, Roberta, for that very generous presentation um, uh, and introduction. So thank you. Uh, and uh, let, let me thank Ricardo uh, and uh, Gil for including me in this discussion. I'm trying to, there we go. Uh, can everyone see the slides? Yes. Uh, so I, I'm really here to bring some perspective about the very interesting data that were presented today, and many of you are, are actually seeing these patients. So I, I want to put forward some hypotheses. So as opposed to working with real data, we're now entering a data-free zone here. And obviously, over the next several weeks to months, we're going to know how much 
this hypothesis uh, is or isn't substantiated by real data. But right now, it seems that what we're seeing is a spectrum of SARS-CoV-2 immune-mediated syndromes in genetically susceptible children who are in communities that have been heavily impacted by COVID-19 disease in adults. So the history from many of these children is that they come from households where there's been COVID-19 disease in the adults in the household. And these presentations I would submit, can be divided into three categories. The first, with, I think, at this point, less than 100 children worldwide, although that seems to be rapidly changing, is this shock syndrome or very severe heart failure requiring ICU management. And this is my tip of the iceberg here. Then at the same time, and I want to emphasize that this is really happening in the United States as well as in Europe, and of course in Barcelona we heard about uh, their data as well from Spain, that there is a remarkable increase in these communities of patients with really run-of-the-mill Kawasaki disease that we would all recognize and treat with no particularly unusual manifestations, although maybe suggested by the uh, presentation from the Brompton, maybe somewhat higher uh, BNPs and, and maybe a little bit more in elevated D-dimers. But in, in general, patients that, that we would recognize as Kawasaki disease. And then, particularly from the London group, and this was highlighted by Mike Levine and his group the other day, they're beginning to see on the wards patients who present with fever, and of course it's a sine qua non of all of these situations, is these children present with fever, and no features of Kawasaki disease, no features of SARS-CoV-2 infection except for their antibody positive, and they have very high cytokine and inflammatory markers, and that's the question mark about what kind of submerged part of the iceberg this might be. So I think what's important about these groups of patients is that they have shared features of antecedent exposure to SARS-CoV-2 virus, and at least in the London experience, a minority of the patients have been PCR positive with a throat swab. And this seems to be a delayed immune-mediated response in children who have had exposure to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Let's see, can you advance the slides for me, please? Oh, if that's possible, Jane. Have, have you been on the first slide the whole time? Think yeah, I've been on the first slide the whole time. Um, I. I don't have a way to advance it here. There we go. There we go. Okay, we, we can deal with this. Um, so uh, I'd like to propose the following, and we'll obviously know much more about this as time goes on. But if we imagine that there's an antigen to which a population of children make an immune response in the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then these children are genetically divided into those that will have the shock or more severe myocardial depression presentation and will require ICU care. And then there are others that will get a more typical kind of, of KD syndrome. And then there are the other group of children who respond to traditional KD triggers. Uh, I would emphasize that finding a virus in a patient who presents with Kawasaki disease certainly doesn't mean in the pediatric world that that virus is responsible for KD. So I think that's very important to remember. And many of our patients will have concomitant infections with a whole variety of miscellaneous viruses. But... Uh, there isn't any compelling evidence that that virus was really etiologically related or the trigger for their syndrome. 
But in any case, uh, these traditional triggers are out there. And we imagine that most of the population, most of the pediatric population makes no response to these at all and uh, gets away with, with no disease. So it's only these few genetically susceptible children who have this aberrant or um, unhelpful response, immune response to uh, whatever these other triggers might be. And they can present also with shock uh, or with more typical KD. So one interesting question is, could there be a shared epitope actually between various things in the environment, maybe and Raleigh's new virus and, and this virus, uh, these shared epitopes you really have to get to by antibody screening because they can be three-dimensional, so they're not necessarily linear epitopes that one could easily find from just a, a, a protein scan using the databases. Um, so that, that's a question that I think research is going to answer as we go forward. Some awkward change of slides there. Um, so why does it matter if there is or isn't a relationship to Kawasaki disease? Well, first of all, I think this provides an amazing opportunity for new scientific understanding. We're still working out what the triggers for Kawasaki disease might be. And if KD can be triggered through an epitope that's shared by other sources in the environment that goes along with SARS-CoV-2, that's interesting or perhaps the virus triggers KD through a unique epitope that only affects uh, a unique population of genetically susceptible children. And these children with the shock syndrome or the, the real cardiovascular collapse do tend to be older than our typical patients with Kawasaki disease. So maybe they've been waiting for SARS-CoV-2 to come along as their trigger. I should mention here that genetics have to play a very important part. We did an impromptu survey that was headed by Kei Takahashi, who's the head of the Japanese Society for Kawasaki Disease, and he was able to survey um, the majority of the 56 members of the steering committee of that uh, society, and they have not seen this in Japan at all whatsoever. So we've also reached out to colleagues in Taiwan and Korea, and no one there recognizes patients that have had this cardiovascular collapse that we're talking about today. So the second reason that I think it matters to think about a relationship to Kawasaki disease is that we know a lot about the treatment for Kawasaki disease. And it seems that, uh, again, the data is still coming in, but the majority of these children respond very well to IVIG. So adjunctive therapies that have been used and studied include steroids and infliximab and anakinra, and some combination of these therapies seems to be very helpful for these severely affected children in the ICU. So that obviously is um, an advantage. In terms of where we go next, I think uh, Jean Newberg already really touched on this, and I think we all have had some version of this slide, but we, we obviously need uh, a registry to get systematic collection of data. Uh, we need to be very careful about unique identifiers so we don't duplicate, uh, publish all of these cases, and the collection of biologic samples uh, is going to be critical. So that is what I would like to say about this situation. Thank you so much, Jane. That was terrific. Um, and I think we're going to move right on to our last speaker, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So um, it's also my honor to introduce another um, of my pediatric ID colleagues, Dr. Stan Schulman. He is the Virginia Rogers Professor of Peds ID and Division Chief Emeritus at Lurie Children's Hospital Chicago and Northwestern uh, University Feinberg School of Medicine. He also has decades and decades of clinical experience focused on Kawasaki and Group A strep, has over 200 publications plus and probably 60 or more book chapters um, and is a long-standing member of the Heart American Heart Association Committee on Rheumatic Fever Endocarditis in Kawasaki. He's also past um, chair of the section of ID for American Academy of Pediatrics and past president of our professional society of infectious diseases. Um, so he's going to give us his observation and insights uh, in this area. So thank you so much, Stan, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Roberta. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Can everybody hear me? Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to participate. Um, and um, this to deal with this uh, new syndrome that emerged really within the last couple of weeks. Um, and I would like to emphasize that I think the terminology to describe this syndrome should be something like pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome associated with COVID-19. Um, so my background uh, with respect to uh, Kawasaki disease um, goes way back. Uh, we've, we've taken care of more than 2,500 Kawasaki patients since 1979. Um, and it, we've that included about 40 or 50 Kawasaki shock patients as well, which no one has used the term Kawasaki, but I'd like to put that out there for you to think about, Kawasaki. But I do not believe that this new syndrome um, is really closely associated with uh, uh, typical Kawasaki disease or incomplete Kawasaki disease, um, or even probably the toxic shock form of I'm sorry, or even Kawasaki shock syndrome. Uh, but rather, uh, it seems to me that these features are more similar to what we see with toxic shock syndrome uh, with overtones of macrophage activation syndrome. So I think that in looking at series of patients, collections of patients in recent weeks or months, uh, there's some conf room for confusion to arise because side by side, with patients who are presenting with this new syndrome of shock, um, we're also seeing typical Kawasaki children in the same same units, same places. Um, and, and in addition, uh, certainly some of these patients with the new syndrome do meet the, the clinical criteria for incomplete Kawasaki disease. And even very, very rarely, they may even meet criteria for complete Kawasaki disease. But they, to me, they are fundamentally different. So why do I believe that this is not a Kawasaki disease-related uh, syndrome? Well, first of all, there's the demographic features. Uh, they seem to be very different. The age distribution is strikingly different. Much older, older children, more teenage, by far more adolescents and teenagers. Um, the, the racial distribution of these patients is extremely different from what we expect with Kawasaki disease, with uh, it, really no reports from Japan, as Jane Burns just summarized, uh, no reports from uh, after queries being made to, in China. Uh, both hotbeds of Kawasaki disease uh, have not seen this complication at all. And uh, we heard a presentation earlier about uh, 73 percent of um, the uh, patients in, at some of the European centers are African background, which is strikingly out of proportion to the distribution of African children uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in those in European countries like uh, cities like Paris and, and London. So, so clearly the demographics are very different. And I would point out that uh, COVID-19 in the United States is having a very disparate impact upon minority populations, particularly African-American populations. Um, and there's something about uh, the coronavirus, this coronavirus uh, that is uh, impacting uh, African patients um, and, and perhaps other minorities uh, uh, disproportionately. The clinical features, in addition to the demographic features, the clinical features of this syndrome, to me, are, are quite, quite different from what we expect with typical Kawasaki disease patients. The degree of abdominal discomfort, uh, abdominal findings, diarrhea, vomiting, is way out of proportion to the uh, not absent GI type symptoms that are seen with, with typical Kawasaki disease patients. 
So that it really seems to be out of proportion as well. The shock that we see is very dramatic here, as you've, as you've heard and as you've seen. Uh, the multi-organ system involvement with acute kidney injury and other organ involvement seems to be very different, very, very different from uh, Kawasaki disease involvement. And, and in addition, the, the, the COVID-mediated luminitis, which some of these uh, patients with the new syndrome um, uh, manifest also uh, typical forms of, of pneumonitis. Seems to me that the cardiac features, in addition to the demographic and the clinical features, the cardiac features are, are, are quite different as, as I think we all recognize. It seems to me that myocarditis and depressed uh, ejection fractions and decreased LV function um, are, are much more the, the rule rather than the exception in this new syndrome. Um, the need for inotropes, the tremendous elevation of BNP levels, um, and, and a relative absence of coronary artery involvement, not, not total absence, but relative absence, um, tells me that, suggests to me that this is a different kettle of fish. It's not related to classic Kawasaki disease at all. If we look at the laboratory features, they do, to me, they seem much more toxic shock-like or uh, macrophage activation uh, syndrome type abnormalities. Um, and in addition, these patients uh, presenting with the shock syndrome very often manifest other classical laboratory features seen specifically with COVID, such as uh, neutrophilia and lymphocytopenia, uh, tremendous elevations of CRP work. We expect elevated CRP levels in all forms of Kawasaki disease, but these, these levels seem to be out of proportion with this disease. Uh, ferritin levels, troponin levels, uh, D-dimers, uh, other inflammatory markers seem to be uh, distinct, for, uh, form a pattern that's distinct from classic uh, Kawasaki disease type patients. And one can ask why don't all of these patients presenting with shock have positive COVID, have positive SARS-2 testing? Well, we've learned from our adult colleagues that the PCR assays for, for SARS-2 are quite insensitive. They're only picking up about 70% of the patients who ultimately are diagnosed in the adult population who are ultimately diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. Our adult colleagues are telling, are telling us that their patients in the acute stages of illness need to be tested two times, three times, even more sometimes before the, the PCR is able to pick up a, a positive assay. And for those, Patients who present with, uh, with a later, later in their course, when perhaps the virus is no longer present in the, in the respiratory tract, um, the, uh, the, the appeal of doing serologic assays is great. The problem is that there are, uh, there's no standardization whatsoever with the uh, PCI, with, I'm sorry, with the serologic assays. Uh, some look for IgG, some IgM, some IgA, some all together. Um, there are, at last count, um, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of, of uh, efforts going forward now to develop uh, reliable serologic assays, uh, but we're really a long way away from those at the present time. So I think the fact that about Three quarters of the patients that we that have been seen with this shock syndrome uh, have either a positive PCR or have uh, a, a, a serologic assay, whichever one is being done, uh, is not telling us that 25% of these patients or more are, are not impacted by COVID-1. I think that uh, I, I, COVID-19. I think that they clearly are.
So overall, to me, the the the, the uh, shock syndrome that's being seen is analogous to what our adult colleagues again have seen in uh, in in this uh, era, this pandemic period, where the early stages of COVID illness seem to be vi virologically uh, driven, uh, but after 10 days or so into the illness, there is this cytokine storm type presentation um, that kicks in in patients, some of whom have previously seemingly made great strides in recovering from their illness, then have a, uh, a dramatic downturn with myocarditis, severe hypo hypoxia, and that stage of the illness seems to be mediated primarily by uh, the inflammatory response to the agent, which uh, may no longer be present at that, at that time. Uh, these kinds of features to me, uh, again, uh, seem to be more compatible with a toxic shock type presentation and or, or frank macrophage activation syndrome. And, and I, I come back to my bottom line is that the, I believe the hallmark of Kawasaki disease is a coron it's a predilection to cause coronary artery abnormalities. The hallmark of this syndrome seems to be clearly uh, the, the predilection to cause severe, even life-ending uh, myocarditis. Um, uh, and, and many of these patients, or most of these patients, and with this new syndrome, appear not to have developed uh, the hallmark of Kawasaki disease of, of uh, coronary artery abnormalities. So I do believe, with, I agree with everyone else on, on the other important feature, which is that we're at the frontier of this particular illness, and uh, we need to develop uh, research tools, uh, research directions, and platforms uh, to fully uh, elucidate uh, the differences between this syndrome and our more familiar Kawasaki disease syndrome. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Stan. I know we've got lots and lots of questions, so I'm gonna switch it over to um, our person who's mediating the questions. Thanks so much. And Margie, do you wanna pull up the question responses if that's okay, and then we'll turn this over to Melissa for the QA. Sure, I can share the results of the polling. Thank you. That's a pretty diverse group of uh, people. Can everyone see the uh, results? Yes, okay. Yes. Thank you. Let's go to the second question, please. Or is this a scroll also? I think pe people can uh, scroll on their own. Uh, let me know, though. Yeah, no, I can scroll at mine, so I, I suspect that's yes. it. Um, number of people in Europe, or I guess it's close to midnight. So thank you for joining us. Uh, and then, so it looks like just on the, the third question, about two-thirds of the people on the call have not directly cared for any of these patients, but this is a uh, rapidly um, identifiable syndrome. And... Uh, I love Kawasaki, but I think we're going to have to come up with uh, with some <laughs> the, the macrophages and, and whatnot. I'll leave that to the experts. I'm going to turn this over uh, to Melissa Jones, uh, who's working here at the Children's National and, as Ricardo said, the incoming president of the uh, Pediatric Cardiac Intensive Care Society, fantastic nurse practitioner. And, uh, Melissa, the floor is yours. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you for these outstanding presentations. This is a, um, quite a lot of information and emerging data um, that I think uh, we'll all have to figure out how to uh, integrate into our clinical practice. Um, just looking at some of the questions, it looks like there's um, a couple of questions around the treatment of, patient, of pediatric patients who are COVID positive and how we should should we, if they do, do not present initially with cardiac involvement, um, should we screen them for cardiac involvement or should we um, bring them back eventually for, um, for further cardiac testing? 
Any okay. Jane, Jane, and Stan, or anyone who Yeah. Can... So, uh, so I, I do think that um, children who have either diminished LV function or who've had dilated coronary arteries uh, need to be followed regardless by cardiology with longer term follow up. And that the, anybody with coronary dilation or aneurysms probably needs to be followed in a way that's very similar to what we do for Kawasaki disease. Mm -hmm. If children don't present initially with cardiac involvement, but they are COVID positive or they're exposed to COVID, would it be worthwhile to bring them back to, for some cardiology, for some cardiac screening and echo? I've been thinking that two weeks later, might be a good time because we know in Kawasaki disease that the coronaries can gradually get bigger. Uh, I think if their coronaries were truly small during hospitalization, you could argue that maybe that's not needed. But the only way we'll know is to look. Yeah. Elaine, do you have a protocol for that at Brompton? Uh, I think... Uh, um, no one has really a, a, a protocol for now. Uh, our point is, uh, uh, first, we have seen a coronary involvement uh, earlier than in classical Kawasaki. And second, we seen, uh, maybe uh, uh, because also we look for this, we see some uh, uh, significant amount of patients with high troponin. And especially for this patient, we would like to see uh, the amount of, uh, of cardiac lesion. So we would basically uh, include in this protocol uh, uh, MRI uh, to see if we have some necrosis, fibrosis, some late gadolinium images, and also to see if uh, we can uh, see some regional wall motion anomaly and, and thickness um, for uh, the patients, especially who have had shock uh, and uh, high level of. Uh, or anti-probability as well as troponin. So uh, that, that's what we are going to investigate. But I, I, can't, I can't say this is the right thing to do. We, we, we are just setting up this platform because I think we have a, a good partnership and good opportunity to, to, to screen for this. And maybe uh, this is not so necessary. We'll see. Thank you. Do you think we're going to try to do the question oh. that function if that's possible, please? If people could just mute your phones. Thank you. Uh, there are several several questions on the chat around um, recommendations um, for antiplatelet management or anticoagulation management. Do you, um, either Maria, Clara, or Elaine, do you have any recommendations around that? So in our experience, uh, we, because I, I, I saw the question, it was exactly for the Kawasaki-like syndrome. Uh -huh. So, and about the IDIG treatment with these patients. Mm -hmm. And I only have data from our patients in Barcelona. So from these five patients that we had, three of them received IDIG. Two of them, they received just steroids because they have this like cytokine storm, but without any, we didn't know exactly what, but they actually, those two patients were the first patients that we saw during the, this pandemic. So we didn't know what was happening. So after treating these patients, this Kawasaki-like syndrome, we, we didn't have this, at the beginning, we didn't know what to do, but now we already know a little bit more. So we are treating with IDAG. Mm -hmm. We are, we, we are treating with uh, IDAG, well, in fact, uh, our uh, colleague, because we really, uh, when I mean partnership, uh, the acute phase is managed by uh, uh, our colleagues uh, uh, from, uh, from St. Mary's Hospital, and uh, uh, maybe if Mike Levine is uh, uh, joining this uh, 
webinar, he could certainly comment uh, better than me. But yes, they have a, a quite uh, heavy anti-inflammatory treatment. All of them will be on IDIG and uh, most of them on um, methylprednisolone, a low dose of aspirin. And then depending on the response, uh, uh, anakinra. Um, so that's that's well, that's what we 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 see, and I think we've seen that they respond quite well to these uh, aggressive uh, treatments. Okay. Jane and Jane, do you think that the relative um, absence of, of shock-like disease in Asia versus Europe and the United States is uh, related to a genetic predisposition or a virus mutation? Uh, I, I can say, this is an answerable question, <laughs> and uh, we don't have the answer. It's it's going to be one of those two things. Or some combination, maybe, of those two things. It is interesting that Kawasaki shock syndrome is less common in Asia than in the West. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Our... Um, Given that these patients are presenting with more shock-like symptoms um, than respiratory symptoms, would you um, recommend isolating these type of patients, even though they aren't presenting with our sort of typical um, respiratory virus? How can we identify them for isolation? I think we're treating patients like that as presumptive uh, COVID when they come in, but I don't know what... Uh, what Joan or uh, Elaine are doing, or Maria Clara? Yeah, same. Yeah, same. and they yeah. are isolated, of course. I mean, it's only the the protective everything. Yes, they are isolated. Yes, they are uh, what we call the red uh, red zone. Yeah. Okay, and then there's a few questions about the first steps to establishing a registry for this data. How do you, how do we start this? I, Particularly without funding at the moment. I think a lot of people are gathering cases, but it seems very important to me that we gather similar information across registries and centers. Um, and ideally, maybe with this, with GUID numbers or with some way that you have so that you don't have duplicate publication in multiple series. But others have probably thought about this more than I have. Well, we, we've been working uh, with our kid care group, and uh, we already have 30 sites across the United States who are working together. Uh, we're funded by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute in Washington, who's interested in having us continue forward for at least another year to collect samples but collect data. And so we've had ongoing discussions with the group in Boston and the group in London about a unified data collection uh, roadmap. Uh, I'm sure it will be a living document and will change, but uh, at least a start. And the GUID idea is really important so that we can make sure that we're not all talking multiple times about the same patient. And we've initiated that with the uh, agency that, that handles that registration. Great. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to follow that. Chat here. Um, okay. Um, I guess we could start to move towards the closing remarks, Ricardo. Did you have a an additional question? No, we can we can do one more question, uh, two more questions, and uh, they will start closing. I'm sorry to extend the time, but it has been a lot of uh, a lot of uh, staff and you know, healthcare providers here. So go ahead, please. Okay. Okay, there are several questions um, still, which we won't be able to get to all of them, but there's a lot of questions about um, anticoagulation and the um, presentation with DI, of DIC. Um, I know we talked about using um, uh, IVIG, but has there been experience with high-dose aspirin and um, anticoagulation, Lovenox and whatnot? 
I can tell you that in Boston, we're using Christina Vanderplum, who is our um, coagulation person, has put together a special protocol for COVID patients uh, and who are very hypercoagulable. Uh, and it does involve um, heparin at a level that, that is in the upper part of the therapeutic range. Um, so I, I think it's very important to be vigilant at least in the adult population, it's been a huge issue. Mm-hmm. Jane, do you think this might be a different pathophysiology, though, in it, these kids? This has the feeling to me more like the KD shock with right. where we typically see uh, a low-grade DIC with high D-dimers, and their problem is really macrovessel thrombosis, uh, which might would obviously also be solved by, by the heparin, but, but typically we would manage the giant aneurysms with a low molecular weight heparin, maybe. Right. It depends on how acute they are. Right. But, but I think it's important that the autopsy data so far, um, and equals to, as I'm aware of, of autopsies of the children, have not shown the microthrombi and the microvascular disease that is the hallmark of what happens in the adults and that their lungs and their hearts are not filling up in the microcirculation with thrombi. So it's a very, very different process and not at all re- reminiscent of what is being seen in the adult autopsies. Yeah, I mean, if, if I may comment uh, about that from Barcelona, this is Joan. Uh, what Maria Clara mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the typical Kawasaki present with a uh, high platelet count. Those Kawasaki-like patients in the setting of a SARS have persistent and consistent low platelets. And it reminds us to the thrombocytopenia in, induced multi-organ dysfunction and uh, with uh, issues in the uh, microvessel. So that's why we treat them with a, uh, a heparin and instead of the regular a Kawasaki the aspirin. Um, okay. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to get to all these questions. There's a whole bunch, but, um, as Gil mentioned in the, um, chat, um, we will, uh, be sure to summarize these questions. Um, but with one, one last question is, has there been any, um, success or, um, experience at least using the antivirals in this setting? None that I'm aware of. No. Okay. Hey, Roberta. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, at least our two patients really did not have any respiratory um, uh, presentation. And the most of the, um, now the FDA EUA approval for remdesivir, for instance, does have the indication for hypoxia or respiratory as the primary indication. So it's not that you couldn't use it, but... One thing I would say, and I was interested in what Stan uh, commented on about the age differences and things. We've had two here. One was really, if COVID was not around, it was for all the world exactly. This kid had all the criteria for Kawasaki, was age four, was really the typical age and whatnot. Um, And then just because of the way we test here, um, we have a lot of uh, ability to test almost everyone coming into our hospital. Actually, everyone coming into our hospital now. But um, anyone with fever at all would get tested in our algorithm. That's how that one was picked up. But that kid really did have a very um, strong myocardial injury component. Um, so a little bit different than the typical Kawasaki picture. But then the second one really was one of these older kids and really had a very specific abdominal uh, pain presentation and was more of an incomplete Kawasaki. So, you know, how you would figure out how to use the antiviral in both of those is hard to know. Um, but I don't. I don't think we really have an idea of what the age really is of these kids. And Mike Bell, who's our uh, PICU uh, chief, has pointed out that even though in the six weeks we've had 14 kids in our ICU with uh, some COVID critical uh, care issue, pretty much all of them have some sort of an inflammatory component. So this seems to be interesting that in that same time period across the world that we have this more specific emergence of this phenotype, which is certainly inflammatory, but really all of them have had some um, component of an inflammatory um, pathophysiology. So we'll have to see. 
Thanks, Roberta. This, this is Gil. I just wanted to ask Dr. Shulman one last question before turning this over uh, back to Dr. Munoz. Uh, and Stan, don't take this the wrong way. You've been around for a while and seen the emergence of a lot of um, <laughs> new illnesses and new names for the things, and then that gets recycled. If you had to sort of quickly summarize what you think this is and where you think this is going, how would you, uh, how would you put that together in a nice little bow? Can I get back to you in a few weeks? <laughs> this is pretty, pretty uh, recent stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I think um, here, my analogy is more with the second phase of adult COVID, which is that cytokine storm type phase, which is associated with multi-organ system dysfunction, particularly myocardial. The, our adult folks presented a, a gentleman who had cardiac standstill, a term I'd never heard before, where uh, by, on his echocardiogram, there, there was no function that could be visualized. Um, uh, that's pretty severe involvement. But, but I think, I think what, what, what I, we have not had any cases in children in Chicago. So everything I, uh, my experience is what I've been able to glean from everybody else and, and yeah. the kids that are coming out. Um, seems to me that th that, that inflammatory cytokine storm phase of adult COVID is the closest that I think to most of the, most of the children, uh, and including a lot of teenagers that are being seen with uh, this new syndrome. But we'll know more even in a month. Thank you very much. Dr. Munoz, would you like to close us out? Yeah, uh, I wish I could, we can stay here longer, but I have to be respectful for uh, your time. I'd really like to thank you so much to all the participants and, and such extraordinary faculty. My team here at Children's National, it has been a, a real success. We had over more than 500 participants, and I apologize for participants that couldn't get in. We're going to try to increase uh, our virtual stadium, stadium and uh, really wait for next week. We have another uh, very good group of participants here from another, another place around the world. Uh, thank you so much again. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. David Wessel too, our CMO also for supporting uh, this endeavor and uh, have a good, very good rest of the week. Thank you so much. See you then. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.